welcome. My name is Isaiah Haywood. I'm one of the summer interns this year uh, for the student ministry team. Uh, I just want to say thank you for joining our virtual service. Uh, first, I want to say if this is your first time joining the virtual service, go to lovefirst.org uh, and you can connect with other people and join our live chat. Also, we have three buttons that you can push. We have a prayer uh, to give, which will happen later on in the service, and the next step. Two of those will be in our, my right corner, and one is going to be below. So thank you so much. Sing with us, church. Jesus, you're my firm foundation, and I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me, of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation, and I know I can stand secure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation, I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word, and your word is faithful, it's mighty in power, God will deliver me, of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure, oh, Jesus, you're my firm found. I know I can stand secure, oh, in Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word, I put my hope in your holy word, in Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure, oh, in Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. 
Greetings again. My name is Isaiah Haywood. I'm one of the interns for the summer uh, for the youth group. Alongside with me is a girl named Maya Timberlake. She couldn't join us for the hosting part of this session uh, because her cousin, who was 15 years old, passed away this week. So they're driving up right now to Chicago. Uh, so before we do anything else, I want to say a prayer for that family, the Timberlake family, the Gale... G Gelos family and the Diaz family. So let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for you and who you are. Uh, Father, I pray for the Timberlakes and the Gelos family and the Diaz family as they are heartbroken for their cousin and their sister and brother and mother. Uh, and I mean, not mother and father, but you know what I mean, Father. Um, but Father, you be with that family in their mourning, and Father, you just stand for them and just let the, your presence be known. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. So again, I wanna say welcome. Uh, this is your first time. Uh, if you would, go to lovefirst.org. This is an opportunity for you to connect with others that are part of this uh, church community and just many things other than that. Uh, we also have a prayer and a give and also, we have a opportunity for you to just say what's up to us, a next step. So please do so in this time. Uh, we would love to connect with you at any time. Um, so thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much, uh, Isaiah. It is a blessing to have uh, our interns here with us this morning. Um, we want to continue in our worship. We've been in a series called Big Tent Revival, and we, we've been talking about worship and how God, through Moses, led the children of Israel out of Egypt and how he dwelled among them in a big tent. And so we want to sing songs this morning that continue to encourage. Uh, we started with Firm Foundation. We want to sing uh, this next song. Uh, entitled In Christ Alone. I want you to lift your voices with us this morning. Let's sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Burn through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross as Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, oh, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in 
First cry to final breath. Oh, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever plug me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen, church. We want to continue singing uh, uh, the song Cornerstone, which talks about Jesus as being the one that we are built on. And so we now, as we have heard in this series, we are tabernacles because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And that was made possible because of Jesus. So we want to sing this song called Cornerstone. Sing with us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. For I stood alone, cornerstone, a weak made strong. And the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, He is Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. And every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And Christ the Lord, cornerstone, weak may strong in the Savior. Lord of all, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne and Christ alone, cornerstone and a weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, He is Lord of all, O oh, Christ. Cornerstone, weak may strong in the Savior.
Now look at here. If you know someone that needs something painted, we want you to contact us. You gotta give us a chance to use our influence to help you out. Just like this right here. Let us know. You. Yes, you. We need you. We need you to come and share your influence with us. I don't care if you paint, if you know how to hammer a nail, if you know how to just love on people and smile. We need you. We need you to sign up, sign up, sign up. We have several days where we can use your help. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do, no matter what you do. Sign up, we need you to come out and help us. It doesn't matter what ministry you're in, this is something for our whole church. Not just the young people, not just the older people, but all of us together in unity. Okay, people, every night of the week of influence, we're gonna have an incredible time in the park lot. Incredible time of worship every night. <laughs> an incredible speaker bringing the word. No matter what. So here's what we need you to do. We need you to sign up for the Week of Influence. Take it away, ladies. So what you do now is go online at lovefirst.org, and you go ahead, and there's a link there to sign up, or email us at weekofinfluence at nacofc.org. Let us know your service opportunities. Everyone, stop what you're doing and sign up today. Amen. Amen and amen. It is our contribution time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, that video. I'm going to say a little bit about that in just a second. Our week of influence that is coming up soon. Um, but first, I want us to um, look at Acts chapter 4. This is a very familiar passage. Um, many lessons have been taught over it. But it, starting in verse 32, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them that there were no needy persons among them. I really love that line. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Also in Romans 12, starting in verse 4, it says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And this is my favorite part of this verse. And each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. Giving provides us an opportunity for the many to become one, for the many to become one. And that is so needed in our world today. When we come together to serve others, we become one. We live out Romans 12, 4 and 5, and we're reminded that we each belong to one another. So I invite you to join us financially with what God is doing here at North Atlanta. We are so excited about that. I also want to invite you to sign up for our Week of Influence. Go to our website, uh, lovefirst.org. You will find information this, there and sign up. We need um, people who will come and serve, right, um, use their influence throughout um, during our week of influence to help others. And then we also need you, if you have a project, something that needs done, then we need you to let us know that so that we can get that on the list and make sure that during our week of influence, we take care of that. This is for everyone. There will be something for everyone to do. And so we want you to give not only your money and your finances, but your gifts and your talents. Please pray with me, church. Dear God, we thank you for your influence in our lives, your influence through Jesus and through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit in us. I ask your blessing on this offering and for the ways we have planned to be a blessing for our community. 
This prayer I ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church said, Amen. From my sorrow to gladness, I have you. What more could I want? So raise my faith a little high. Set my spirit on fire. Lord, asking you to move. Cause you're the God of restoration. Bring joy that you bring, won't you? Revive me, revive me with 
joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive, revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Won't you revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. So now my hands are up higher. Set my spirit on fire. Lord, we're asking you to move. You're the God of restoration. continue worshiping. Our God is a way maker. We want to sing about that right now.
stop working you never stop you never stop working It's great to be with you all this morning, wherever you are. It's great to join you. I grew up at this church, and so I'm psyched to be home with all of you again. Maybe it wasn't under the circumstances we'd wished, but it feels good to be home in the midst of the year that we've had. As Stephen mentioned, we've spent the last several weeks talking about the tabernacle, that big tent, the tent of meeting that we read about in the book of Exodus. And the tabernacle was established as the meeting place where the Israelites would go to meet God, but also meet one another. Because how you encounter God shapes how you encounter others. Now, one thing that strikes me most about the tabernacle, about this meeting place, is that God did not hide on a mountaintop. God did not put God's self out of reach somewhere only for the most holy or the most righteous or the people who have got all their things together. No, God did not limit God's presence for a select few. God placed God's self right in the midst of the people, smack dab in the middle. The tabernacle in the midst of the people conveyed God's radical presence in and with and for the people, which tells us an awful lot about this God that we are worshiping this morning. But it also tells us a lot about who we are in relation to that God. You see, if people imagine God to be reserved and tucked away and only accessible to the perfect and holy, well, then people tend to embark on solo journeys to go find that God. People will imagine that Reaching God demands personal perfection. That to tap into God requires that we get everything right. And so then people become fearful and paranoid about holiness. People start to think that maybe our righteousness is the admission ticket to that mountaintop God. 
And if people dare think that they reached God because they got it all right, well, come on, that changes the way that they interact with other people, right? I mean, you've got someone coming into church believing that they found God because they got things right. Well, how do you think that shapes the way they interact with others at the meeting place? But no, God did not hide out in some remote corner waiting for us all to get it right. No, God tabernacled in the midst of us, right in between us, right inside of us. God is here. God is home. God is in this building. God is outside this building. God is at this table. God is at your lunch table. God is in the air you breathe in, and God is in the air you breathe out. Right? We sing it, right? It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pull out our praise. We pull out our praise. We're talking about a radical, divine presence. And when you come to know that God wasn't waiting for you to get it all right, and that rather God came to you and pitched a tent right in the middle of your life, well, that actually changes the way that you interact with others. Rather than looking up and away for God, we start to look around here. We start to look inwardly. We look at the faces of friends and neighbors and strangers, and before you know it, we start to see God everywhere. And I've come to think that this is foundational for what we do at the Lord's table. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34, We get to listen in on some drama taking place at the church in Corinth. And I don't know how much you know about that church in Corinth, but truth be told, it's a hot mess. Like, you've got real problems. Like, people are going to leave. Maybe the church might split. People are mad. People are hurt. And love has left the building. So part of what Paul is trying to do in this letter is to help the Corinthians get to the heart of their problems. So when he starts to talk to them about the Lord's Supper... He does not mince words. He begins this section of the letter saying, basically in layman's terms, y'all are blowing it. So what was going on? It seems that the Corinthians had lost touch with the purpose of communion. The text says in verse 21, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper. And then one goes hungry and another one becomes drunk. What? What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? That's Paul being sarcastic. In this matter, I do not commend you, which is Paul's way of saying, you're not getting any pats on the back today. This is serious. Because if we come to the table forgetting why we gather in the first place. If we come to the table and forget God in our midst, if we come to the table and are so consumed with our own personal journey of finding that distant God, then we, and we forget to see God in our hungry neighbors and friends, well, Paul would say that we bring condemnation upon ourselves. It's serious. Forgetting is lethal to the people of God. This is why remembrance seems to be such a central theme in Scripture. Remembrance. The people of God are told time and time again to remember. Remember what? Well, for example, in the Ten Commandments, the Israelites are told to remember the Sabbath. Maybe you grew up hearing it, keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath. Well, what does remembering have to do with Sabbath rest? Well, remembrance has an active quality. To remember is to be decisive. To remember the Sabbath is to be intentional about it. Remembrance sets you up to do it. In fact, prior to the giving of the Ten Commandments in both Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Israelites are reminded, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, why do the Israelites need to remember this before they receive the commandments? Because remembering gets you ready. Remembrance does something to a person. It is active. It's transformative. 
to remember God, who God is, who God has been, and what God has brought you through, the act of remembering changes you. It prepares you to step into that life that God has called you to. You might know that after the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the author of Deuteronomy expands on the concept of memory in chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 begins with the word, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then, the author tells Israel to always keep this at the front of their minds. Write it on your doorposts. Bind it on your arms. Teach it to your children. Do not forget. Do not forget who God is and why you have been brought here. Because forgetting, it's serious. It's lethal. Remember. How many of you like to work on puzzles, like jigsaw puzzles? I sort of love puzzles and hate puzzles um, because the thing is, even if you have a method, and most puzzle aficionados do have a puzzling method, uh, even if you have a method, you might set like the corner pieces in one pile and you put the edge pieces in another pile. And if you're like me, you start putting pieces that look alike in their own piles. So then you start to put the pieces together. And I like to start with the corners and then put all the edge pieces in place. And before I do the hardest part of sorting through the remaining pieces, looking for patterns and textures and colors that might indicate their location in the puzzle. And maybe you get going in your puzzle and you come across an empty spot. And you think to yourself, you've already sorted out the pieces, and you think to yourself, I have seen that piece somewhere. It is on this table. I remember seeing it. But now I cannot find it, and all these pieces are starting to look the same to me, and my eyes are starting to cross, and my head is hurting. And wow, Amy, did you really think that the family needed one more puzzle during COVID lockdown? And we did so many puzzles during COVID lockdown. And we ran into this maddening experience again and again. You nearly go crazy as you remember seeing pieces but struggle to find them and put them in place. But you know what? It is so unbelievably satisfying when you finally get that one last missing piece. And you pick up the remaining piece in your hand and you look and it fits perfectly into place. And there it is, the big picture. You take a step back, you let your eyes adjust, and marvel for a moment that this thing, which was just in a million pieces a few days ago, now makes something so whole and complete. You know, after Paul chastises the Corinthians for their petty divisions, their selfishness, and their lack of love for one another at the Lord's table, you know what he tells them to do? To remember. He reminds them that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To be reminded of that night, the night when Jesus was betrayed, is to be reminded that Jesus' own body was broken. Like that bread, broken open, Jesus in his mortal flesh died. But knowing what he would face on the eve of his death, he took the bread and broke it and told his disciples this most essential thing to remember when you gather at this table, to remember. You know, I always think it's interesting that in this sense, to remember is also to remember, like the members of a body, to put back together, to reconstitute the body of Christ. It's something that we can only do together, that we would miss out entirely if we were busy pursuing some solo journey of holiness and righteousness. No, we're in it together. Lately, I've been thinking about two kinds of people. And I'll confess to you right now, I've been both of these people in my life. 
But there are Christians who feel entitled to church. And then there are the Christians who know they need church. It's not that the church saves, only God saves. It's simply that these people have come to know something about who God is in the world, and that is that God has chosen to remain in the midst of the people, the imperfect, tired, fumbling, disagreeing people. And if you want to fellowship with God, look no further than the people around you. These Christians don't expect church on their own terms. No, these Christians show up and gather at the table because they know what it's like to struggle with a broken puzzle. Are you tracking with me? I know I'm doing metaphorical gymnastics here. But like my dad says, shake your head, yes, no, or maybe it'll go faster. Has your life ever felt like a broken puzzle where the pieces are everywhere? Some of you know what it's like to have lost so much so quickly that you can't imagine waking up tomorrow. You know how it feels to think to yourself, I have no idea how I'm going to face tomorrow, and I don't even know what next step to take. And maybe your life was broken up because of some mistakes you made. Maybe your life was broken up because of some mistakes other people made. Or maybe your life got broken up because crises beyond your control suddenly dropped in your lap. And maybe for a moment you thought, how am I possibly going to survive this? And then, and then, someone gave you a phone number to call. Or someone knocked on your door. Or someone said, hey, I got a place for you. Or someone said, hey, why don't you come to church with me sometime. Or someone sent you an email or dropped you a line just to check in and say, hey, I've been there. Here's how I survived. Here's how I'm doing this. Here's a good next step. For a lot of you, that's how you ended up here on a Sunday morning. For some of you, that might have happened 20 years ago. For some of you, it happened yesterday. But I know that something happened that got you here. You didn't get here alone, and you're not going anywhere alone. Because we remember who God is and what God has brought us through. And we are here to remind each other. We come to this table to remember and to remember. We come here, and with Christ in our midst, the pieces of our lives start to come into place. This is why we gather at the Lord's table. And this is what we can hope for. That when we dare to see God in our midst, in our own lives, and in the lives of those all around us, when we remember God's presence in our lives, we build up the body of Christ. And if you ever forget, don't worry, because we will be right here ready to remind you that this is the body of Christ for you, in you, and with you. So let us eat this bread and drink this cup in remembrance of the one who brings us together and who holds us together. going to sing this song about the way that we show up for those moments in our lives that challenge us most, the, the moments that bring out the fighter, and we're reminded that Christ goes before us, and that not only does Christ fight on our behalf, he lays out a table for us, and that our, our fight is praise. There's a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. It's 
It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. It's a table like you prepared for me. In the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. And I believe you've overcome, and I will lift my song of praise for what you've done. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how, yeah. In the valley, I know that you're with me. And surely your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. And this is how I fight my battles. put down our guards Christ goes before us and sets a table and we can invite others to join us at that table no need to fight all are welcome
Wow, what a service that we have had today. Uh, I have a few announcements. Again, we are going to be doing June 7th through the 10th is our week of influence. Uh, the reason I love the church so much is because we, as a church, love first no matter what. And so this is a week that you get to come out and get to do that. Love first no matter what. And any opportunity you get, you know. And then our second announcement is there is no class today, no Bible class after service. So um, go home and have fun with your families. Uh, and I want to leave y'all with this. First John 1, verse 3, it says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day.